Let's go to God in prayer as we begin worship. Oh God, we, Scripture says you want to change us from glory to glory. So this morning, Lord, we come in this glorious day and we await what changes you will make in us that will bring more of your glory into us. We offer ourselves to you in worship that what we bring to you would glorify you as we praise and honor and listen to and sit under your wonderful word and your glorious name. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today is from Exodus 34, verses 29 to 35. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking to God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. The word of the Lord. These two texts that we heard this morning, they connect to each other in ways that um, we probably aren't going to all understand <laughs> this time this morning. Maybe, I don't know, until we, like I told the children, until we're face to face with Jesus ourselves. But there are three important components of these two stories that I want us to think about this morning. The first is God's glory. The second is prayer or the closeness and conversations we have with God in Christ and with Christ and God's word. Well, the passage, we'll start with Exodus. The passage comes after Moses has been on the mountaintop for 40 days. But that was the 40 days when the Israelites were down there and they got a little impatient and they didn't think he was coming back. So they thought they needed to make their own God. And they came up with a golden calf. Moses interceded on their behalf because God wanted to get rid of them. And, and then God called Moses back up the mountain. And it's this trip up the mountain that he comes down from in our scripture today. And when he's up on the mountain, he has Moses, God has Moses rewrite those 10 words. This time, Moses asked God, can I see your glory? Show me your glory. So while Moses is safe in the cleft of the rock, all the goodness and the glory of God passes by Moses as God proclaims God's glorious name. Scripture says Moses bowed his head towards the ground and worshiped. Is it any wonder when Moses came down the mountain with those two new tablets that the people were afraid to look at him or to come near him? His face, he didn't know he was carrying the glory of God with him. But his face told the story, and they were afraid. So then he, just, he called to them, and they came to him, and he explained the commandments that he brought from the Lord. In our passage from Luke, Jesus and his friends, Peter, James, and John, are headed up the mountain for a time of prayer. Now, this is just a little bit over a week after Peter has spoken the revelation that Jesus is the Messiah. He announced that to the disciples. 
And then Jesus explained that he would have to suffer, be rejected by the religious leaders, and be killed, rise the third day. He also told them at that time that if they were to be his followers, they must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow him. And some would not taste death until they'd seen the kingdom of God. Well, there they are on the mountaintop, and it's as they are praying, well, as Jesus is praying. They don't really tell us if the disciples are praying or not. Scripture doesn't say. But while Jesus was praying, that's when he is transfigured, when he's transformed and joined by the two, Moses and Elijah, who represent the law and the prophets. And they talk with Jesus about his exodus. That's the word in Greek there, is exodus. So they are talking about, so my, wait a minute, Jesus did go through Exodus. That was what the Jews did. Well, Jesus is making his own Exodus. Now, commentators writers don't all agree. Some say Exodus is actually his death, and some say Exodus is his travel to Jerusalem to his death and his resurrection and ascension. So you can choose which one of those you like. That's what the commentary writers have to say about that. But any way you look at it, Jesus was going. He was going. And that had to do with Exodus. But what the conversation, whatever that conversation was, the disciples almost missed it because they were weighed down with sleep. They didn't seem to grasp the importance or the implications of this prayer time that Jesus was having. And although they were half asleep, they did stay awake long enough to notice that Jesus didn't just have a shiny face like Moses, but he was totally transfigured in the glory of the kingdom of heaven. So there is some thought that when Jesus told them that some would not taste death till they saw the kingdom, he was talking about Peter, James, and John, that they would get to see what the glory of the kingdom looked like on that mountain. I wish I had been there that day. The, it is interesting that Moses and Elijah are the two that show up. Some think it's because Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. So they were there to kind of be for the, for the whole fulfillment was all three of them there together. I love what one commentator wrote about um, this text. He, you know, Peter didn't know what to say. He was flabbergasted, but that didn't stop Peter. People, Peter had to, you know, as they say, process out loud. So he's talking anyway, even though he doesn't know what to say. You know, building projects, booths. He, maybe he's referencing the, 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 the festival of booths. No one knows. I'm not sure Peter knew. But in the midst of this kind of mindless chatter that he's got going on, this cloud shows up. And it covers him and his disciples, the disciples. And it says that they were terrified. But one commentary writer said that God interrupts Peter. As he was speaking, Scripture says, God interrupts him to say, this, this is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. And last night at Coffee House Church, we discussed where the emphasis was in that, ver in that conversation. Was it, this is my chosen one? Listen to him? Or... This is my chosen one. Listen to him. I mean, you know, there's a lot of ways you could look at that. We don't know what, where God emphasized which, what he was trying to say. But we certainly know that what he said helps us understand that when Jesus says all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him, we see where that came from. God had chosen him, and we were to listen to him. Then the cloud is gone, and it's just... Jesus, no Moses, no Elijah, no cloud, no, no God speaking out loud. And they said that they went down the mountain, but they didn't tell anybody about it. Well, now we know someone must have told someone because it's in our scripture. So I guess eventually, after they'd had time, maybe, maybe clear after Pentecost, they finally started to realize what that whole conversation was about. These two stories are jam-packed with powerful images. What is God's glory like? When do we or do we see God's glory? What can we learn? 
Well, Moses and Jesus were both in conversation with and closely relating to and with God. And both were impacted by that closeness. Moses' face, he didn't even know it was shining, and Jesus was totally transfigured. I wonder if we sometimes underestimate the powerful nature of prayer. Maybe we have a limited view. Our expectations just aren't very high of what can happen when we pray. It happens that this morning I was reading my um, devotion I read in the mornings, and there it was, a definition of prayer, just so I could bring it to you today, I'm pretty sure. J.D. Walt says um, this, Prayer is the call to a deep awareness of the presence of God, a surrendered attention to the Lord of the church, Jesus Christ, a keen attunement to the voice of the Spirit, and a bonded attachment to one another in the body of Christ. Prayer is not something we initiate. Prayer is the initiative of the Holy Spirit. We do not initiate, we participate. Prayer is not ginning up more spiritual activity. Prayer is getting low to the ground and cultivating receptivity." End of quote. That's an amazing description of what prayer is and what we see with Moses on the mountain with God and then takes, takes to a whole new level when Jesus is on the mountain with God. And the disciples are just trying to stay awake to comprehend what they're witnessing. I do think we get sleepy. Any of you fall asleep when you're praying? It happens to me. We get sleepy. We're concentrating and we fall asleep or, or we're afraid that maybe, uh, maybe we're going to get too shiny. Or maybe we don't, those people that are a little too shiny and a little too spiritual, they're a little scary sometimes. And we're not sure about them. We might shy away <laughs> from that whole experience. And sometimes I think we're just a little shy about just prayer in general. Uh, maybe it's not convenient. Uh, we, we might not know what to say. Or maybe we just don't feel like we're holy enough or whatever. You fill in the blank enough. So when and what, I promised you the word of God. How does the word of God fit into all of this? We've heard of God's glory. We've heard of, we've heard of um, uh, what was the other thing I was going to say? And now we're talking about the word of God. So let's go back to the word of God and what we are going to talk about. Prayer, God's glory, and the word of God. When Moses was on the mountain, he received the Ten Words. We call those the Ten Commandments. But more than that, Moses received God's word that God would continue to go with the Jews, with the Israelites, because Moses had interceded for them as he prayed with God. Even those, little pe those were some stiff-necked people. Moses heard God proclaim God's name, the Lord, the Lord a God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousands generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children to third and fourth generation. And Moses worshiped as he heard that. God's word to us humbles us, especially when we realize our own stiff-neckedness. And we bow in worship. We maybe don't go all the way to the floor, but I see most of you bowing your heads in worship. And sometimes it even God's word energizes us, and it, it brings glory into that situation we're in as we realize, well, God does forgive us when we are how we are, and when we are asleep to who God is and what God wants us to do. Truly, this glory is seen most perfectly in Jesus. He fulfilled the law and the prophets. He is the living word of God. He shows us the glory. He lived life without sin. He loved others as God loved him. He was the light to the, of the world, and he worshiped God fully. 
and he would journey to Jerusalem. He would go through that exodus to become the Lamb of God slain for not only the Jews, but for the whole world. So we could be delivered from death and sin once for all. His glory was seen on another hill in another way on Golgotha where he would suffer and die. This is the love of God lived out as he gives up his life. That was truly glorious. And he did that so we might enter into the glorious life with God. The word of God, prayer, and God's glory are all bound up together. And that Apostle Paul has to go and say that all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image, that same image of Jesus with one degree of glory to another. This comes from the Lord, the Spirit. This is our life in Christ. When we let our veils down, I have kept thinking this morning about our veils we've been wearing all this time, but that's what came to my mind. But whatever the veil is that has kept us hidden, we let that down so that we might receive the glory of God in Christ who we follow and then be transformed into that same image. Remember the image on the cross. It may not look like what we think it might have looked when Jesus was transfigured on that mountain, but it is glory nonetheless. And that glory is, keeps transforming us all of our lives. You're not done yet. God's not done with you yet. God still has more glory to transform you and me. Thank you, God. Our job is as we submit for that glory to happen to us, we have to submit ourselves to that call to prayer by the Holy Spirit with Jesus. And, and we need to read God's word prayerfully, led by the Spirit. And I pray that we will be then transformed in this process so that unlike the disciples, if we'd read that next several, seven verses, I think, which we did not read, they went down that mountain and a day later, they did not know how to minister to the man who came with his son to them. I pray that we will know. We will be filled with God's love and glory like Jesus, and we'll be ready. We'll be ready for when the Spirit calls on us and initiates that time of prayer, whenever that next crisis appears. You see, I think this is the call to every follower of Jesus. It's not just the pastor. I'd like to wear that t-shirt. It's not just the pastor. You can get me that. Not just the pastor. Yeah, I want, because we all find ourselves in situations and in trials where the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. And will we listen? So I was going to tell one story, but the Lord changed my story this morning based on the week I've had. So I'm going to tell you the story of this week about Dorothy and Kenny and me. And when I asked Dorothy this morning if I could share this, she said yes. And the words I want you to tell them are believe and trust. That's straight from Dorothy. Well, Kenny, two weeks ago, went to the hospital with a blood clot on his heart. He didn't know what he had. He thought he was just short of breath, but that's what he had. And it was not, it's been an ordeal from beginning to end. Um, he was flown to Baltimore, and he was in the hospital, and they put the heart-lung machine on him, and then they decided he was better enough they could take it off, but he didn't, wasn't breathing so well, so they had to put the intubate him so he'd breathe, and things got more interesting, so he can't talk. So Dorothy's going every day to visit, and so she, at night she would call me at whatever time she got home, and she'd give me an update. So finally, when the whole intubation thing, I was like, the Holy Spirit was speaking. Just that nudge, I said, okay, Dorothy, I think we need to pray on the phone. So we did, and we prayed together. 
And then the next time she called, I said, Dorothy, I was reading today about David and Goliath. And I think I need to share you that story about how this Goliath you're facing, God has, God has what it takes to fight the Goliath. We don't, but God does. So we prayed again. We prayed about Goliath, this blood clot. So then um, uh, she called again, and I said, you know, Dorothy, I feel like, well, do you want me to come to the hospital with you? She says, yes, we want you to come to the hospital. So on Monday, I went with Dorothy to the hospital. And we had prayed on that Sunday night. And that Monday we went, and one time we got there, they'd taken the, they, they were able to unintubate him, whatever the extubate him. Is that the right word, Patty? I'm not sure what the medical word is, but they were able to take that tube out. And he was breathing on his own with some oxygen. Well, I don't know that we looked terribly shiny, but we prayed with Kenny that day. And um, we, he was able to just lift his hand up and put it there so we could hold one hand. And we prayed. And as I said, I don't think we looked at all shiny, but I do know that I kept hearing Dorothy tell everybody that she could meet. First, she kept telling them I was her pastor, which she didn't need to do, but she did. And then she kept telling them, we have a direct line. Well, she actually said, I won't lie. She said, the pastor has a direct line to heaven. But here's the thing. It wasn't just me. It was me and Dorothy. And then me and Dorothy and Kenny praying. That's, you know, it was the Holy Spirit nudging me. It was Jesus in the middle of our prayer. And that's where that line came from, that direct line. That's where this glory happens. And the tube comes out and the clot gets small enough that he is in a nursing home there at Homewood, at Homewood, right around the corner from where Dorothy and Kenny live. That's not me, that's not Dorothy, that's God. And that is when we listen. I don't always pray when I'm nudged. I'm just like you. Sometimes I have to call back like I did when I was interviewing with this PNC. Say, I think I was supposed to pray with you, but I hung up before I prayed. And we called and prayed. Sometimes we don't listen the first time, but thank God the nudge comes again. And so you say whatever it is the Spirit gives you to say. <laughs> it doesn't have to be perfect because God is in the middle of that prayer. And we do have a direct line. His name is Jesus and the Holy Spirit is the one who connects us. We need to keep watching for the glory of God just as we watch that blood clot get smaller this week. And we watch Kenny shine a little brighter and begin to eat. We need to keep watching for the glory of God. It's not always easy to see, and we have to believe, and we have to encourage each other, and we have to keep praying. Would you join me in prayer? Oh God, sometimes those mountaintop experiences aren't on mountains. Sometimes they're over the phone. Sometimes they're through text messages. Sometimes they're in a place of great distress. I bless you this day that you keep going and you don't give up on us even though we're stiff-necked people. We're hard-hearted sometimes. We're worried about we won't have the right words. Lord, would you help us pray like the children do? My confirmation class has been praying out loud. Simple prayers that they weren't prepared to say. I just ask, would you pray as we close? And the children we're praying. Oh, thank you, O oh God, that you love us enough to send your glory to us in Jesus. And you love us still today by sending your Holy Spirit to move us out of our very comfortable places, to be able to step in where others are in distress and offer a word a word of hope, a word of belief, a word of trust, a word of thanksgiving. 
that we do have the privilege of praying to you, O oh God. And sometimes we, it seems like a luxury, prayer does, but it's a necessity. And sometimes praying and reading our Bible seems like a luxury that we just don't have time to afford ourselves. But I would offer this morning that it's a necessity and that you have reminded us of that this morning, oh God. Thank you for that reminder. So important, your word is so important that you sent, called Moses back up the mountain so you could send him down with the 10 words of your word to us in Jesus is so important. Maybe the most important thing we do first thing at the day is to read your word to us. We'll never know until we're faced with that moment when we need it the most. Thank you that you are still changing us from glory to glory and that you send us out in this very sad and sorry world with lots of warring words and hurting people to be your glory. Maybe we weren't looking for that to be the word to us this morning, but I believe from what I've heard this morning from you, O oh Lord, that that is your word to us. There is not a plan B. So I thank you for this transfiguration story. As we have some prayers we need to pray today that need a lot of belief and trust and glory. This morning, we lift up Bruce White, who has gone to, be, to the hospital this morning. So Lord, we, we believe you for your glory this morning for Bruce. We believe for your healing grace and for your, for your wondrous doctors and nurses that are caring for him, we believe. We believe that you have more than being ill, <clears throat> than being ill, that you have your grace and mercy ready to pour out on him, even now as we pray. You are sh sharing your glory with Bruce. And Lord, this morning, we believe for your glory because we see Stephen in church this morning. And we know that he still has some health issues that need attention. But Lord, we are blessed that he is here and we, we can pray. We can stand here in your glorious place and we can believe for the healing grace you have for him this day. That Lord Jesus, you are still our healer. And we can say, I believe and trust in your, your mercy that pours out of heaven, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, even right here. And we pray the same for Buck, who is here with us this morning, who awaits that surgery on his knee. We believe you, Lord, that you are in the midst and we don't give up hope, that you are mighty God and all of this is easy for you. Our hard part is believing that you are indeed in the midst and have not given up. You are in the midst of all of us gathered here in the prayers that may not be spoken out loud. You are in the midst of the prayer that is silently spoken in our hearts. And you are answering with your glory. And Lord, we lift up places in our world that are in desperate need of your glory. And the one that comes to my mind today is Ukraine. Oh God, we pray and believe that you have not abandoned the people of faith in the Ukraine, that you are with them, and that you are mighty God. And there is nothing too hard for you, and that includes the Russians and whatever armies they want to throw at them. Oh God, we believe that you are the God of peace and justice, and you haven't forgotten those who are calling on you, even as we call on you for your intervention, for your power and glory to be seen. 
and for there to be peace and hope and protection. Lord, we give you thanks and praise this day. We lift up the Kearns family um, for Diana's mother, who continues to recover, Lord. We invite your glory into that recovery, even as we lift up Chris's father, Donald, who is experiencing the end of his life. And Lord, we ask to see your glory there, too. We know you don't desert us in any of those places. And Jesus, you go with us in the places of Exodus that we go. We pray all this, Christ Jesus, in your name, as we pray together the prayer you taught us. Pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We give thanks for the gifts. We give God praise and thanks for who God is. We thank you that offering plates still have money in them and that people are still giving online. And we are grateful that God continues to bless us, that we might be God's blessing to others. Even yesterday, there was a need that came to our congregation. We and I am blessed to say there is a pastoral care fund for people who are in need. Let's go stand as we praise God that we can be a part of that care. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise all creatures here below. Praise Him. Oh God, we thank you and praise you. We can't thank you and praise you enough. We just need to say thank you. We've sung it. We say it. We bless you. And everyone said, Amen. Let us say what we believe by using our Apostles' Creed this morning. I believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Christ, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let us continue with our closing hymn, 192, Lord, the light of your love is shining.
the things God puts in my mind while I'm singing. So here's your charge and your benediction. Send forth your word, the song says. God says, send forth the word. You know who that is, don't you? That's all of you. You're carrying that word that God's given you out to whoever needs us this day. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.